Hi, I'm Chris Plum, head coach and CEO of Carmel Swim Club. This is Off the Deck Podcast. Off the Deck champions Carmel Swim Club's mission, teaching excellence through swimming for life. To more fully meet that mission, we are constructing a new pool, the Carmel Swim Academy. Carmel Swim Academy will provide an entry point for more children in central Indiana to have access to life-saving programs. It's true. Drowning is the leading cause of injury-related death in children ages 1 to 4 and the second leading cause of death in children 5 to 9. But there is hope. Participation in formal swimming lessons can mitigate the risk of drowning by 88%. We are compelled to use our expertise in swimming to make our community safer and to ensure every child has the opportunity to learn to swim. To learn more, visit www.carmelswimacademy.org. Now let's get on with the show. Uh, I want to talk a little bit before we get into our guest, uh, just saying thank you and the value of saying thank you. Um, just recently, we finished our 10 Days of Courage, Perseverance, and Giving event, and we raised $127,000, which will go to our new pool. And we're just so thankful and grateful to all those people who donated and who showed up and just, um, you know, we're trying to make the world a better place, one swimmer at a time, and we value the water and what it can do for children and the lives that it can change. And, you know, I just want to say thank you. And I think um, growing up for me, uh, I remember my grandmother, <laughs> uh, Marge, everyone loves it. She only went by the name of Marge. She, she uh, got really angry at me one time because I didn't say thank you for, uh, for my Christmas gifts. So from that point forward, my grandmother taught me the lesson to always say thank you and appreciate those who help you out in the world. So to all the people out there who've given so far, thank you. And as you go about your daily life, just remember to appreciate what you have and to say thank you uh, to those who've helped you out. So I know this next person, our special guest today, Amy Bilquist, swam at Carmel. She, uh, I think, has over time learned to appreciate the good things in life. And I'm very excited to have her on. Amy Bilquist is the uh, Indiana State record holder in the 50 free, 100 free, 200 medley relay, 200 free relay, and 400 free relay. National record holder uh, in the 400 free relay in high school. She was on a relay team that went 315. U.S. Junior Pan Pack multi gold medalist, third at the Olympic trials in the 100 back. And in her senior year, she won four. She's on a four winning relay team. So she definitely understands the value of team. Uh, still inspires me to this day. Cal Bear grad, please welcome Amy Bilquist to the podcast. Hi, Amy. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for getting on with us today. No, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here talking to you. Yeah. Well, you know, let's let's start with you know we're talking about saving lives and and water safety. How were you introduced to the water, and um, how did you grow up around water, and what did it mean to you? I think kind of a super similar mission to the Carmel Swim Academy. I moved to Arizona when I was about three years old. We had a backyard pool, no fence, and I hadn't had much water experience up to that point. So my mom really made it a point to almost every single day bring me in the water, bounce me around, get me super comfortable with it. And I think that just being in the water sparked my whole love for a sport of swimming. Um, being in the water for me was just so like therapeutic in a place where I just felt really comfortable and safe and I wanted to get better at being in the water. So I was just begging my parents for swim lessons. And then I did a summer rec team from ages four to six. And by six years old, I was pretty much on my knees begging to be on a club team. And so I've been swimming clubs since I was six years old, but it definitely just started um, in a water safety kind of way. And um, since then, my love for the water has obviously progressed and kept me in the sport for as long as it has. Yeah, and still still here today. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're in Arizona in the desert, but still everybody has like a backyard pool there. So learning to be safe, obviously your parents saw the value in that, huh? Yeah, most definitely. I think um, my dad was a swimmer. So he, he really understands, and my mom doesn't, can't really swim. So it was this really this funny balance where 
yes, I was in the water with my mom, but it was, I, she could stand. I was obviously very small. I couldn't stand in the pool yet. Um, but I think it was honestly water safety for both of us. Like we were both kind of like getting more comfortable with water at the same time, which was, um, which was really important to my dad and, um, obviously very important to my whole family now. Yeah. So you kind of have a maybe interesting track because you were not just a swimmer you were also a very good volleyball player. And I think at some point you had to make a decision. I, I think that decision was made a little bit easier when you moved. But so what was it like growing up being a two sport athlete, both in the water and a volleyball player? Um, it was quite exhausting, but it was really fun. And I think there are certain aspects of both sports that benefited me um, and the other and um, both cons as well. So I think for me, the benefit of playing volleyball was that I was crushing people off starts and turns because I was jumping more than everyone. My legs were stronger. I was getting power like, from our dry land, from the kick sets, and then from going to volleyball. And I, um, I do think a negative was that I had swimmer ankles though when I played volleyball. So I was um, spraining those babies left and right. Um, eventually had to like tape and then wear ankle braces to be okay. And then I think reversing, it also helped like upper body strength, shoulder strength, because not only am I swimming, I'm blocking, I'm like hitting balls, all that stuff. And I think, um, a negative it might have had on me was absolutely no social life. But I think that also taught me the importance of if you want to be good at something, it, it takes sacrifice. So I was getting up in the morning, I was going to swim, then I was going autumn, like right to school. And then after school, I was going right to the pool. And I was maybe able to do like three fourths of the practice and I'd have to get out. My mom would have like Chipotle in the car. I'd be doing my homework on the way to volleyball. I'd get home and it would be about nine, 10 o'clock. And you know, you're waking up next day at four and having to do the same thing over and over. Um, and it really, um, stepping back also told me, or also taught me to really appreciate my parents and everything they do. You know, I was, I was young. I wasn't driving then. I mean, my mom was doing those same hours with me and pretty much sitting in a car all day, shuttling me from one place to the next. So, um, it also taught me valuable lessons about, the value of a team, you know, swimming is a very individual sport. Yes. You're doing it with a group, but volleyball is the exact opposite. So I think I really had to appreciate being on a team more and it not just being about my individual performance, you know, it's about everyone's at that point. So I think that has really honestly helped my relays in the long run because I've been able to, you know, it doesn't matter how I'm feeling when I'm standing behind this block for this relay, I have to be as selfless as I can and I have to do everything I can to make sure the whole team's ready to do this relay. Um, so those are some interesting carryovers. Yeah. I mean, obviously when you're on a volleyball team, you got to work together and then the ball mm -hmm. comes over and the blocking and the spiking. And then, you know, on a relay team, you've got to step up and do your part. Right. And you, yeah. I think always have embraced the value of the relay, uh, you know, and you were on a re high school relay team that went three fifteen that broke the national record by five seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys pushed each other to get to that that record which i i don't know anyone's come close to that and, and then to go to cal and have be on your in your senior year on four winning relays i mean that's the you know the epitome of of team at the fastest meet in the world right so mm -hmm. you know how do you balance the individual part of the of the sport but make your teammates better to have those relays be so good right if you were just all alone you wouldn't be able to accomplish that right i think it was an art that i definitely had to learn throughout my four years of college especially um especially when you get to college swimming you know it's it's more of a business than high school or club swimming you you really have to be on top of your game and perform really well and i think um when it got to my senior year i um <laughs> was pretty riddled with injuries at the front half of the year so i was diagnosed with three stress fractures in september was in boots on both feet, like switching in the middle of the day and then got out of that mid-October, was bringing groceries in the next day and broke my foot. And so, you know, then back in the boot, back on crutches. And now at this point, I've missed the entire season. You know, I, I've been out, I've done pre-training, but I haven't done anything else. And um, I think for me, I was really struggling because I wanted to go out with this big senior year in my head. And I wanted to you know, be the best captain that Cal's ever seen and 
and and done all of these important things and i and i think me not being able to perform my best really humbled me in the fact of okay how am i leading you know i can't be in the pool i can't be with them every day i can't be supporting them in the water how can i support this team and support these girls in any way i can right now you know no one really wants to hear great job you're doing great from the person who's sitting on the bleachers watching the practice and can't do it you know like that's really hard so i think for me that that whole season had really taught me the importance of how to lead a team and how to get the best out of people in in my way what i think is the best way you know i wasn't really it wasn't the tough love approach i don't think any of the girls at that point needed it and it was really what can I do for you? Hey, like you seem to have an off practice. Is something going on that you want to talk about? Not like we're trying to win a national championship here. Like, why are you swimming slow at practice right now? Like, so I think doing that um, really helped the team and honestly myself become a better leader. It made me closer with the girls. And I think when, when you have that team bond like that, you're, you're honestly willing to go to war with those girls. And, and it showed our senior year. You know, I didn't have a front half of the season, but I, that was my best NCAAs all four years because I was just so bought into the team and I wasn't going to accept anything less of my performances for the team. It's like, I wasn't swimming for myself anymore. And, and our relays weren't swimming for themselves. You know, we had Abby in a full like arm wrap that NCAAs after she hurt her elbow and she was still willing to like get on the blocks a year out from the Olympics. Like she didn't need to do that, but she did that for our team. And and that was really important. And I think it also taught me, you know, you can't ask for um, support from a team or a teammate without expecting accountability. Um, and I think that's something I had been struggling with in the past. It's like, okay, like, come on, support me. Like, tell me I'm doing a good job. But it's also to get that support, you need to accept the accountability with it. And so that season, you know, making sure I'm supporting the team, but also being like, hey, like, you know you could have done better today why didn't we do that is there something going on um so for me that was a really important lesson and like growth and team leading and really making sure we're getting those relays to where it's not going behind the blocks and trying to do four individual performances we're trying we're we are laying it on the line for this team and the fact that every year a college team is different and this is the last time we'll all be together um so that was like really really special moments at that point because you can you can see selfless swimming on the last turn of every race. You know, you you can you can visually see it when you know it's day four of NCAA's, it's someone's thirteenth race and they're still coming off that last wall hard and they're still keeping their head down. So I think um, that's really cool to see. Yeah, it seems to me like what you were saying there was I'm gonna invest in you, right? And if you invest in others, they'll they'll kind of bring it back to you three times as much maybe would you agree with that exactly i think from what i almost wanted from my teammates being injured my senior year was a lot of support and i and i had to give that support in order to like see it come back to me yeah. so yeah definitely yeah and you talked about your, your your injuries right and um for those of us who on this podcast who don't know you're six foot three and maybe still growing um <laughs> maybe maybe we'll, right see. we'll see but uh you know i think to to stand here today knowing all the injuries you've been through has been you know a testament to your will and character but i mean have there been low times with this and how did you manage those times when you're just like oh man do i can i really continue to do this yeah i mean there's definitely been low times and i think um a lot of like it seems like my last good season like last healthy season was probably the very first season i came to carmel you know the that september to december season and after that it, i've kind of been unfortunately like had an injury or injuries every season but i think at carmel when i was first there it was a lot of denial like i'm in pain but I, i'm probably fine and then i think the moment it started to get really bad i distinctly remember you, Claire, and I were at, um, I think it was like the junior national team camp in Colorado wow. Springs. And they're like, okay, for afternoon practice, we're going to hike the incline. And I remember, you know, having fun with my friends, but every single step I took, my legs wanted, I thought my leg was going to break every single step. And I 
So I remember coming down and talking to you on the pool deck that night and I was like, I'm not okay. Like, I really don't think I'm okay. And then had my first experience with getting diagnosed with three stress fractures at once. And, you know, I think when I was young, it was like, oh, like I have so much to do in the sport. Like I'm not done. I'm not going to let this stop me. Like I have such big goals with Carmel and Chris and I talk about all these things I want to achieve. And I, I was still super motivated. You know, it was the first time it kind of happened. It was, it was new, but it wasn't a pattern at that time. And I think as the years have gone on and every single season, having something that see at the time is like, this will put you out for probably the rest of the season, or this will do that. It's been every injury I've had, it's been harder and harder, but it's been harder mentally. You know, all the injuries are not, they don't feel good physically, but they feel worse mentally because I, have such big dreams in this sport and all I want to do is train and all I want to do is race and having that taken away from me mentally is really hard but I've learned to you know give myself those periods of the day you know like maybe okay for two minutes I'm just super overwhelmed with emotion okay cry it out for two minutes then get it together and move on because sitting here and feeling bad for yourself over and over is not going to do anything so like How can I get better in these moments when my senior year, when I had the stress fractures and the broken foot, I remember the team would be in the weight room and I'd be in the cardio room right next to them on the arm bike. And I distinctly remember they wouldn't really give me something to do. They're like, all right, just go work out, I guess. And I would be on the arm bike and I would go a couple uh, minutes, like strong, easy-ish. And then I would close my eyes and visualize my 100 backstroke and crank on that. And I would try to open my eyes and be like, all right, that should be my 50 split. And I got pretty good at it. So I think it was about, you know, like in those injuries, doing stuff for my mind that was super mentally stimulating and making sure I was still thinking about my race and getting better, even though I couldn't always be in the pool. And I think I have proven to myself and hopefully other people that you can get better at swimming and not be swimming all the time. Um, So that's been a really important lesson in my injuries, but they've been mentally tough and I'm not going to sit here and be like, you know, get knocked down seven times, stand up eight. You know, I, it's definitely, you have to hark back to the courage and perseverance. Like, do you have the courage to try to overcome this injury. And trust me, it's going to take all the perseverance that you have to get there. So I think for me, honestly, like I used to make fun of that in high school, but looking back, it's like, yeah, it's what, these are the two things that you need to overcome anything that you come across. You need the courage and you need the perseverance. So that, that's been, um, it's been fun to kind of come full circle with that. Oh, the turntables have turned, right? They have. Yeah, Michael Scott. Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, I never used to make fun of that. And it's, it, it's like, um, the, I think about it too, like that courage and perseverance, and it really does carry over to so much more of your life. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about something a little bit more fun. You know, um, here you are now a pro swimmer and, um, you, you have sponsors and things like that. And I, um, you know, going from the college scene to kind of your professional life, um, you know, talk, talk to us about that transition for you. Um, yes, it was very interesting. So we finished NCAAs mid-March and I was actually at my first professional meet about mid-April. It was a really, really fun meet. All meets should be like this. We just did a 50 free and we did it in a couple rounds, you know, it was just a shootout. So that was really fun. But I think it was my first experience of, okay, I, I'm swimming for money now and I'm swimming for like, this is my job. You know, it's still really fun, but it's like, I I have to expect a certain level of performance in order for me to keep doing this financially. So um, that was a good first experience at that and knowing, okay, I have to, the training is just different. Like I'm still training for the love of the sport, but I still, I need to be able to perform more consistently and perform when I need to perform in order to keep supporting this dream. So that was really fun. And I, I decided um, to move out to Arizona at the time because obviously I was, I was still finishing out my degree at Cal. So I was going to be there till late May. And then at that point, it was at the time, almost 13 months until trials. So I had 13 months to make um, a decision of where I was going to go. Was I going to stay at Cal? Was I going to go somewhere else? And Long story short, I had family in Arizona and it was cheaper in Arizona. And so I 
I moved out to Arizona and began uh, my training as a professional. And my first meet with Scottsdale, I remember I swam pretty well the first day, was really excited. The next day had the 5,300 back, got in for prelims, caught a, like someone jumped in a little weird, caught a wave when I was doing fast backstroke, came in and hit my hand on the lane line and broke it. So I remember, okay, this is how my professional career is going to start out too. Like it's only right to have a broken hand to begin. So um, that was really tricky in the sense that this is also the time I'm looking for sponsors. And this is also the time like I'm really trying to do all of these things. And and how do I show up to these events with a, with a cast on my hand? You know, it doesn't look great. Like, you mm-hmm. know, it doesn't look great that you've been riddled with injuries. And then now you're walking in with like a hand cast. Like it. it So the optics weren't great of it, but I think it also helped me align with the company who was actually there for like me as a person and not just my performances. And that was really nice because I I remember being down between two companies and one of them really not taking me because I had a broken hand. So that was really nice. And then to be able to, at the end of the season, win a national championship that season um, individually, which was my first time ever, which was really exciting. Um, I think that just really kickstarted my professional career and and showed me, you know, as much as people think pro swimming is different, it's kind of the same thing. And, you know, having an injury and then overcoming it, I'm like, okay, this is, this is just what my career is at this point. And um, it's not going to change professionally, but professional swimming is really fun, especially in the ISL and getting to do things like that and being able to travel more and just focus on swimming. You know, I'm not waking up earlier before practice or staying up late to do homework. So that's a really nice part about it all. Yeah, so you you've been in the ISL and you were in Hungary for an extended period of time during the pandemic. How did you, you know, you didn't have your personal coach there, right? So how did you get better during that time, and what what did you take away from that experience over in Hungary? Oh, it was really really fun. And the first season I was on LA Current, and this um, past season I went on to DC Trident, and I think that move for for me was really good personally because i went on a team where you know the first season that baker was on there so i was like the second backstroker and swam a little like they moved me around i wasn't swimming really everything that i wanted and so i moved to dc trident because i wanted to be kind of like the forefront of a team i really wanted to be able to show what i could do in the events i've been training for and um so at dc had dc this season it was it was quite funny because with 10 teams and all the COVID restrictions, we were really like, our practice times were changing every single day. So you would have a like 6 a.m. a.m. practice one day and then the night before your practice was 8 to 10 p.m. So it was just like a lot of going with the flow and not really overthinking it. And just like, whenever you're at the pool, do your work. Whenever you get to be in the gym, do your work and, and don't overthink it. You know, I think before I would have been like, oh my gosh, like, I'm getting out of the pool at 10 p.m. and I have to wake up for 6 a.m. Like I'm not going like I need X amount of like hours of sleep. But so that was really fun to learn to go with the flow. And also I didn't have my coach there and he was sending me these workouts. And I was like, I just want you to know that I'm like the last one in the pool with like Bethany Gallant. Like I don't know if I need to be swimming as long as her and like everyone's out and just like stretching. And it, it I wasn't really trusting the process at that time, um, but I'm, I'm really glad I did and I did all of that work and didn't cut it early because it was a long time when we were there and I didn't want to have my best races at my first meet and be on a decline set. So it was really about, you know, in those situations, you, for me personally, I had to keep up my work and I had to keep up my endurance in between the meets. So I wasn't really resting as much as everyone, I would say, but I think in the long run, that really helped me out to when we got to that third and fourth meet, I was still going the times I wanted to go and even faster and not um, declining that I think a couple of people learned the hard way, like how to manage your training and your racing when you're doing it so often there. Um, But no, it, it was really fun, met a lot of great people. We couldn't really go anywhere um so much but we we were allowed to like take an hour walk every day so a lot of us took advantage of that and it was just nice to you know walk around an an island in budapest with people you don't really know and get to know them a lot better yeah i'm sure that's be an experience you you remember for the rest of your life so Mm -hmm. especially during the pandemic and you know as this pandemic's winding down are there any any things that 
like you felt like you learned or took away from going through all of this? I think it definitely taught me that there are bigger things in swimming. And I think I began to learn that lesson after I missed the team in 2016. And it's kind of been an ongoing lesson then with like a little bit of reality checks here and there. I think it was really important. Like when this first happened and the Olympics got postponed, I was really, really sad but I also understood it. And like the first thing I wanted to do was just like go be with my family and for us all to be together. And I think that really kind of just really sent home the fact that, you know, swimming is so fun and it's so amazing that I got, I get to do this as a job and I've dedicated so much of my life to it, but it's when push comes to shove, it's not the be all end all, you know, I was making sure my family was safe. We were being smart before I was ever trying to get pulled time and and also to know that you can it's not optimal all the time but you can go two months out of the water and come back and have an amazing season i think it's just you can never count yourself out the second you count yourself out of course miracles aren't going to happen but if you never close the door for that there there's a high chance of that happening and i remember actually claire's collegiate coach carol um talked to me on deck my senior year when we were dueling texas i was in a, a boot on crutches and she was like what do you do now and just explaining to her and she was just basically like there's you know there's senior magic there's always magic don't give up on it and i think I, that's honestly been replaying in my head since she told me that you know if, if you don't shut the door to impossible and miracles um you'll you'll get some every once in a while yeah and um you know it's funny how those little moments with people right they just they can last and like Carol probably just thought she was, you know, saying a nice word to you. And here you are still kind of using it as inspiration. And I know, you know, you've talked to a lot of people throughout the country and, and probably have done that for somebody without you knowing. But, um, you know, how do you view your role with the younger people in the sport today? And what advice do you have for them? I really value um like reaching out and talking to the younger generation. And anytime I'm really asked to do a talk with a club team, I, I try to make it work in any way. Um, for me, it, it's really important because I know from personal experience, your coach can tell you the same thing 10 times, but when some random person says it the 11th, that's when it sticks. So I think for me, like really being able to, if I can be that person that can like have something stick in someone's mind, or I can be that person who can say it a little differently and isn't their coach and then it sticks. That's really awesome. And also just making sure I'm reaching back to the younger, like female generation. You know, I was, I've been tall my whole life. I was pretty skinny growing up. A lot of people don't think you get made fun of for that, but you really do. And, you know, then growing into a tall athletic body, it's like, there's definitely like, you know, confidence issues and self-conscious like issues just happening. And I think being able to, you know, when girls are struggling with that or girls are going through stuff in high school, being sure not to minimize that, but also be like, no, you should be confident in what your body looks like because this is this why you're the swimmer you are. And, you know, you should be confident and you should be happy that you have a healthy body right now. You know, you, maybe you have more muscles than other people, but that's awesome. Like being strong is awesome and being strong is attractive and being strong helps you do what you love the best that you can do it so also like making sure that that message gets across because i wish i had someone tell me that when i was younger you know i remember going to trials when i was 14 and and a college that i really really loved and like dreamt of going to at the time had made a comment about like what i looked like to my coach and i just remember that entire meet thinking about that comment like I wasn't thinking about being at trials I wasn't thinking about my races I was thinking oh they think I I look not right because I'm too tall and I'm too skinny so I just think really like hammering home that your body is your is your vessel and your engine to being good at your sport and to to really appreciate that and to be easier on yourself you know um, we don't always see like super tall strong athletes in like social media land so i also think like for me posting certain things is not just about me posting it it's okay if someone scrolls and see this image maybe they'll feel better about themselves like oh i look like her or oh my muscles are as big as hers and, and just stuff like that yeah i know i appreciate you um saying that and i i know 
from you from knowing you personally how important that is to to spread that message and it's great advice to all the uh athletes particularly the female athletes out there and and we appreciate you being an awesome role model um let's get into some fun questions here um okay so assuming that your legs are healthy who would you like to do a social kick with with anybody in history or current time oh my gosh in history oh that is so so tough you know what i'm gonna go with natalie coglin and i've done it i've kind of like i've known her uh I've spoken to her before she swam at cal um but she is just someone who is just every single word she says is inspiring and she does it. I don't even know if she realizes it all the time. And she's someone I looked to, up to when I was young and she gave me advice at critical times at Cal and I would just love to talk to her even more and be like, you know, about just, just life in general, not always even swimming, like how is it being a mom now? And just, I think she would be um, really fun to social kick with. Yeah, just a short side story on Natalie. You know, I was uh, a coach with you in Doha and here I am like, you know, I don't want to say the token club coach, but that's kind of how I felt <laughs> out there. <laughs> and, um, you know, you got, you know, I think you, I haven't been around Olympians before like that. And so just sitting down, like Natalie would just talk to you just like a normal person. And then a year later, I'm like, there's no way Natalie remembers my name. And she did. She said, hi, Chris. So I was like, all right, I'm going to be a swimming nerd, even though I'm supposed to be a coach and know all this stuff. I thought it was pretty cool. So yeah shout out to this a very genuine human being right right and mm -hmm. and um it was it was pretty cool so okay what song would you least like to pop up during workout whatever you were playing when i was there oh wow you had a playlist for a little bit that was just i didn't know any songs it was i've never heard it before um no i don't know i don't always like like the edm vibe i'm not a no probably anything like that but you so definitely no got better that. while i was there just to say you got better because okay. you started taking right. suggestions from the crowd <laughs> well as i like have said before on this podcast if it's a long set and i'm listening to most of the music i'm gonna play what i want to hear but if it's yeah. like that's a what short... you would say yeah right yeah that hasn't changed um mm. would you rather have practice in the deep end or shallow end <laughs> Oh, the deep end for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, if what would be your perfect I am order? Um, fly, free breast back maybe. Oh, okay. I like that. I don't know. A little, yeah. A little mix. Mm -hmm. Uh, kickboard or no kickboard? No kickboard. Okay. Would you rather have the bee in a pool? That's too warm or too cold? Too warm. Okay. Lane leader or caboose? Lane leader. Okay. Uh, and lastly, what is your favorite Gatorade or Powerade color? Oh, like the light blue one. I think it's light blue. I don't know okay. what that one. Yeah. Amy, you have the next few minutes. What do you want to say to the world or what, are, what do you want to tell people or... What's coming up for you? Um, I think I just first want to start off and, you know, in this point of my career, I think I've been becoming really reflective on everything that's, you know, helped me get to this point. So I just want to give a big shout out to like you and Ian and just Carmel Swim Club in general. And anytime someone asks me like, what was the changing point in your career? I, I would say my move to Carmel every single time, you know, it was moving there. I know I was not the easiest swimmer um to coach i had ideas about what i thought was best for me and you had ideas and more knowledge and saying maybe that's not what's best for you and i think after coming to our our middle ground and you really taking the time and explaining things to me i think that's what it really was it was my lack of knowledge and understanding when i first got there and i remember sometimes you'd be like all right come with me in the office and you'd have this like big giant like chart and be like okay we're in this six block now and it helps this and this and this and i and I, I just remember those conversations so distinctly and i think at that point in my career i'm like every practice has a bigger purpose you know every practice is part of a bigger plan and you have to trust the process and i used to just make so much fun of those little quotes and never really truly believed it I, but i feel like that 
point in my career, moving to Carmel was a was a really big switch because not only did I get faster, I became a better person out there and I became more confident. And you taught me to not only have, do I need outside confidence? Like I need to find that internally. And I think that's what helped me, you know, get through four years of college at a high level university. And I think that's what's helped my professional career now. So just thank you to you, um, especially in like Carmel in general. I, I would not be where I am or who I am today without it. Um, so I really appreciate that. Upcoming for me, um, we'll be at trials. And, um, you know, I think after the summer, um, it, that's going to be the end for me in my swimming career. Um, but just knowing um, how, how excited, how excited I am and how I didn't think this is how it would come to an end, but I'm really glad that it's going to be on my terms. And it's not because I don't love the sport anymore. It's more so the fact that I think my body, I just really need to start listening to my body and what it's been saying for a while now. Um, so excited for that and um, actually moving out to Austin. So that's kind of what I have in the uh, upcoming future and just um, getting kind of prepared for the interview process with jobs now. Uh, that's a little daunting, but I feel, um, I feel confident about it and knowing that what I've learned um, in my swimming and throughout my career is going to help me land a job, you know, to be able to walk into an office and be like, hey, I haven't had a conventional job, but these are the things that I've learned and these are the things I can bring to the table. And you know what, I'm going to be super coachable. So that um, that's an exciting thing. Great. Amy, we thank you for your time today. And all of Carmel will be cheering you on in a few weeks at the uh, in Omaha. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you.